So it's my pleasure to introduce the next uh, speaker for uh, this session, uh, Mark Wisner. I know Mark for over 25 years. We were both advised by the late Charlie O'Melia, a Clark Prize a laureate. Uh, Mark is the James uh, Merriam uh, Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Duke University. Mark is one of the pioneers in environmental nanotechnology. He is also uh, the director of the Center for uh, Environmental Implications of Nanotechnology. He received uh, the Clark Prize in uh, 2011. And today we'll talk about not implications of nanomaterials, but rather applications of nanomaterials in membrane systems. So, ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Mark. <laughs> I'm on the edge of my seat wondering whether or not my Mac to PC conversions are going to work here, so we'll see. Um, well, uh, it's a privilege and a pleasure to, to present to you today, and uh, I want to recognize the illuminated vision of uh, uh, Jeff, I don't know if uh, whoever put this schedule together is great because half of the work has been done for me. Uh, we heard from uh, David Sedlak and then just now from Vern about uh, various points about the importance of membranes. So I'm going to talk a bit about membranes. We heard from Pedro about nanomaterials. So I don't need to define uh, in French or Croatian what 10 to the minus 9 is. And uh, so what I'm going to, and I think we're going to hear from Amy Childress, I'm guessing, more about the system level uh, aspects of membranes, uh, using different driving forces and uh, looking at overall system design to do things like desalination. I'm going to focus today on the interface between uh, nanomaterials and membranes and kind of go to this issue that um, Vern mentioned about incremental uh, uh, progress. And I'm not claiming that uh, in this faddish world of nanotechnology that we're going to eliminate uh, dysentery or uh, solve uh, cure cancer or uh, solve world, world hunger, but uh, I think there are some very important incremental uh, uh, contributions that have been made in improving the materials that we use to make membranes that will enable us uh, to do things that we couldn't do before. So that's, uh, that's the topic here today. Um, so, I mean, the, as Pedro had mentioned, you know, the, and it kind of depends on where you live as to what the definition of nano is, but in the United States, the NNI definition of nanotechnology is it has to be small and it has to have novel properties. And it's these novel properties that inspire all sorts of new uh, products. In the case of membranes, um, we can uh, uh, use them in all sorts of different ways. We can use nanomaterials to template membranes, basically using them as, as molds for uh, the, the membrane that we end up with. We can integrate nanomaterials into the membrane matrix itself, uh, so making composites. Uh, the membranes themselves might be entirely made out of uh, nanomaterials. I'll give you some examples of that. We can use nanomaterials in membrane reactors. And then we can do all sorts of things together. I'm showing this, this Swiss Army knife here with the idea that we can, um, one of the holy grails is to, to make membranes that have all sorts of multifunctionality. So, um, uh, start with this picture here. This, this slide I've been using for quite some time. It, it really represents research that got me involved in this area. It was, uh, back in the mid-90s when I was uh, still at Rice University and a colleague there, Andy Barron, and I got a green chemistry grant from the EPA to develop different ways of making um, basically metal uh, nano, uh, metal containing nanomaterials. Um, the, the typical process if you were going to make, for example, a, uh, a ceramic membrane would be sol gel. You'd start in dissolution in, in with the dissolved materials and precipitate to make small particles that you deposit on the surface and center into, into the membrane. This process uh, is, goes the other direction. You start with large bulk scale material and you whittle it down, okay? And the chemistry is very, very simple. Uh, uh, I refer to it, uh, the formula is is uh, uh, dirt, uh, water, and vinegar. And uh, the dirt in this scenario would be uh, a clay, but he might. Uh, the the uh, vinegar is, of course, acetic acid. And what you're doing is you're just cleaving this off and making uh, very monodisperse suspensions of nanomaterials that you can then uh, uh, deposit on surfaces. And in our case, we were making uh, centering those and making ceramic membranes. And so we can make ceramic membranes all sorts of different ways. This actually combines one of the other um, 
uh, uh, strategies that I'd mentioned, that of templating. So you could actually deposit these nanomaterials into a, say, a latex template. So latex uh, uh, particles would form the template. You deposit these small nanomaterials around it. You center it, burn off the latex, and you end up with this, this sort of interesting looking structure here. And you can do other things with this. Now, within the realm of dreaming and, and hype in nanomaterials, there's some things that are good ideas and some things that are not so good ideas. And I'll also maybe highlight some of the things that I'm not so excited about um, that have occurred over time. Ceramic membranes um, are kind of midway in between there. I, I, I think still, the, uh, while there's been a lot of advances in the surface area that we can get in a ceramic monolith these days, and you can take this kind of technology and apply that directly to the monoliths that we have, uh, there are still issues with processing and so on that, that drive the costs up. There are other um, strategies that um, I'd probably review uh, maybe two to three papers, or at least see them come across my desk a month on um, using titanium dioxide or silver nanoparticles uh, in, those are the two biggies, in membranes. And um, I'll highlight a couple of problems with this. We have done some of this work. So here's an example of a TiO2 membrane, the idea being that because TiO2 is a, is a photocatalyst, that you can make a reactive membrane. That's great. Um, that's why we did it. But I just, again, I don't want to oversell it uh, because it, it, a critical limitation here is that when you, when you make a membrane process, for the cost to work out, you need to have a high packing density of the membrane. You need to cram a lot of membrane area per volume into a membrane module. That doesn't leave uh, much room for light bulbs. And so the question is, is how do you get light into these systems? And so if there's, there's students that are kind of thinking about nanomaterials and membranes and projects, uh, you might uh, want to steer away from just simply making another TiO2 in membrane composite and think about this problem of how we channel light into a very uh, high uh, packing density uh, uh, membrane module. Here's another one. This is bismuth. This is much more recent work that we've done. It's really a variation on the theme uh, the, of using, uh, well, Pedro had mentioned, silver nanoparticles in, uh, in membranes, uh, copper. Uh, and in this case, we've done it with the bismuth. This is the same material you might have, for example, in peptobismol. Okay, so it has uh, antimicrobial uh, characteristics. The problem with all of those scenarios is that they're sacrificial. That is, you put the nanomaterials in the membrane, and then they slowly leach out over time, uh, leading to a loss of efficacy over time and uh, to changes in the, the membrane structure itself. So there are going to be some limitations in that. We need to recognize that, that, that primarily where these are going to, to, to be useful or are going to be in niche applications, point of use, uh, I would suggest, applications primarily. But it does work. In the case of the bitmet, this is a Raju uh, Bud Reddy's work, uh, 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 where uh, he's looked, again, this, this graph is virtually identical to the one that Pedro showed earlier with silver, where uh, bugs love to grow on the surface of the untreated membrane, and they don't on the surface of the, uh, the treated membrane. Um, another strategy that we've looked at uh, is using the antimicrobial properties of C60 and um, uh, modifying, in this case, it was a, a ceramic membrane with C60 on the surface. And as you increase the amount of C60 on the surface of this membrane, uh, both bacterial attachment and bacterial viability uh, decrease. And so this is interesting. You don't need to, while C60 has some photocatalytic proper, uh, properties, those properties are not what are in play uh, here in uh, decreasing um, uh, uh, microbial growth. Or, uh, establishment of a, of a biofilm. Okay, so where I have a little bit more optimism is in uh, some work that we've done uh, now for quite a few years on carbon nanotubes. Okay, so there's different kinds of carbon nanotubes. They come in different flavors uh, depending on, you, it's basically a graphene sheet that's wrapped in different ways, and the way you wrap that, this sort of chicken wire material, the way you wrap that will make it either a, a semiconductor or a conductor, and those, those have different properties. Uh, because uh, one of the novel properties of, of uh, carbon nanotubes is their strength, they also have some very interesting photocatalytic properties. They have some interesting properties with respect to their hydrophobicity, all sorts of interesting things that we might do with these. So this is the first example of some work uh, that uh, uh, we did where we tried to take carbon nanotubes and put them into 
a, uh, a polysulfone membrane, not knowing very much about polymers and so on, and it didn't work. Um, uh, what you basically the, the the carbon nanotubes because they're quite hydrophobic, they tend to remain. They have a high affinity for the uh, the solvent in the process in making these membranes. And when you make the membrane, that solvent is basically evaporating uh, out of the the mixture. And uh, so you end up with pockets of uh, these sort of uh, nano uh, dust bunnies. Uh, uh, that um, concentrate all of the carbon nanotubes in one little pocket. What we'd really like to do is have a nice even distribution of carbon nanotubes throughout the entire polymer matrix, and so it's sort of um, functioning as, as I like to say, as nano rebar to make these membranes stronger, so that we have membranes that don't break as easily. So, you know, hollow fiber membranes. If you have a module that has uh, 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 tens of thousands of, um, of hollow fibers in there, one of those breaks. That uh, represent a point, represents a point of compromise for uh, 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 removal of uh, pathogens and so on. And so if you can reduce the breakage, extend the life of the membrane, that would be a good thing. It didn't work here. And this is just some data that shows you um, that that's the case, where you look at uh, so-called Young's mod modulus, the slope here of uh, uh, stress and strain, and basically these things uh, uh, did not uh, 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 do better with the carbon nanotubes. As a matter of fact, they did, they did worse. But we kept working at it. So um, uh, this is uh, uh, some work uh, of uh, uh, um, Hossam, uh, Che, and, and myself, where we were looking at uh, uh, making, modifying uh, polyamide membranes. So this was, this was more of a, a desalination application. In difference with the, uh, the um, uh, approach of simply mixing carbon nanotubes in with the polymer and hoping that the thing would take, here we're actually grafting uh, the carbon nanotube to the, uh, the, the polyamide as it's formed. And as you can see here, as you increase the content of carbon nanotubes in these membranes, uh, their mechanical strength increases. And so that was. That was what we had anticipated uh, initially when we started trying to, to do this kind of work, and indeed, um, uh, uh, it, uh, it worked. Uh, and this just sort of illustrates that you have a nice distribution of the carbon nanotubes throughout the, uh, the membrane matrix. Um, some interesting things happen when you do that. You can, um, you not only change the strength of the membrane, but you change, you can change the the hydrophobicity of the membrane. So the carbon nanotubes are extremely hydrophobic. That leads to, some people have suggested making aligned carbon nanotube membranes. I'm not partic particularly optimistic about that. Uh, we could talk about that offline uh, because basically it moves a lot of material to the membrane, very high fluxes. It's going to move all the stuff that follows the membrane uh, up to the surface of the membrane as well, and you still have to deal with that. But uh, in this case, uh, using the hydrophobicity of the membrane uh, of the, the carbon nanotube, as you add more and more to that polymer matrix, uh, what you do is actually make a more and more hydrophobic um, membrane. And I'll come back uh, to this kind of a measurement in a moment and show you that you can go the other direction by changing the properties of the carbon nanotube. What we were surprised to see was that with relatively small sacrifices in permeate flux, we were able to get uh, substantial increases in both salt rejection and, um, and uh, organic rejection across these membranes. Okay, so here's another example going back to the first case again, uh, not uh, being one to, to give up. We uh, uh, looked again back at the polysulfone, trying to make a, a, uh, uh, an ultrafiltration membrane. This is uh, uh, Charles Illinois' work uh, uh, where uh, uh, he's managed to uh, uh, put various concentrations of carbon nanotubes in here and can also change the degree of functionality on the carbon nanotube. And here you can perhaps see a couple places where there are carbon nanotubes scattered across the surface, but they're also very nicely distributed throughout uh, the, the entire body of this, uh, uh, of this uh, 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 ultrafiltration membrane. And, uh, what one sees is you change the functionality. Here it's carboxylation on the surface of a multi-wall carbon nanotube. So it's, it's several layers of these graphene sheets wrapped around one another. And uh, as you begin to increase, as you begin to uh, increase the functionality of the carbon nanotubes, you actually are able to increase the, uh, the Young's modulus, the strength of these, uh, 
of these membranes because essentially you're getting more of the material into uh, the polymer. It's, it, you're getting a better um, uh, uh, distribution and uh, uh, mix of, the, of the, the carbon nanotubes within the structure. But as you go further and further in a functionalization, you actually lose strength. And the reason is, is that their affinity uh, for the solvent increases and they're actually lost in the process, as I'll show you in a moment here. You can look at contact angle, and uh, you start out with no functionalization on the surface, and it actually compared with the unmodified, uh, which is the horizontal line, the unmodified uh, uh, membrane, you increase the hydrophobicity, okay? So there's no functionalization on that, as I showed you earlier, that would increase the hydrophobicity. But if you carboxylate a bit, you can actually decrease uh, 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 the, uh, in increase the hydrophilicity of the membrane, and then continue to do so as you, uh, as you further functionalize it. So we're very interested when we use nanomaterials, we're very interested in uh, also looking at potential environmental impacts and what this means so we're not solving one problem to create another problem. And so one of the things we want to look at in sort of a life cycle of these materials is what potentially happens to nanomaterials in the production phase, what happens in the use phase, and ultimately what happens in the disposal phase. So here's, here's an example of carbon nanotube loss as a function of the, the degree of uh, functionalization on the, the carbon nanotube. Again, you increase the degree of carboxylation and in the production process you actually lose more carbon nanotubes. These would be carbon nanotubes that would be going into waste streams now that would have to be treated at the point of production. Um, then you might say, well, I've made the membrane and I'm going to put it in a water treatment plant and I'm going to begin to, it's going to foul, so I'm going to have to add acids and bases and, and oxidants and so on to clean the membrane. So uh, we have thrown some of these uh, 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 things, just for everything from clean water to clean the membranes up to, uh, to, to chlorine. And again, uh, saw some release of, uh, of carbon nanotubes. Comparing these two, you can see here we're talking about really quite small percentages compared with uh, the previous graph here, which again, even these numbers are, are not outrageously high. Um, but there is a, again, you, there's a tendency to lose more of uh, the carbon nanotubes that are put, that you'd like to get into the membranes as they're further functionalized, and it's just because it's increasing their uh, affinity for the aqueous phase. Um, in some related work, we've looked at uh, uh, materials that have been supplied to us uh, uh, by uh, NIST, where multiwall carbon nanotubes have been, in, and, and carbon nanofibers and nanoclays and nanosilver have been incorporated into various uh, polymer matrices. Given that this is where the bulk, you know, we, we've done predictions of nanomaterials that might end up in the environment, and when you take the production amounts and um, a colleague of mine, uh, Bernd Novak, I'd like to say, he divides by Switzerland, I divide by the United States, but you, you, you end up with a concentration, the, the production amount divided by some location. And when you look at those numbers, they're relatively small. And they're going to be even much smaller when you recognize the fact that all those production amounts aren't just simply thrown out in the environment, they're incorporated into products like uh, 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 membranes and other polymer matrices and, and uh, display screens and so on. So we got these materials from NIST and there were some very specific abrasion procedures and some other things that were done to, to simulate wear these materials. We took the wear uh, material and we exposed it to a number of different uh, animal models, in particular uh, a zebrafish and a worm here, C. elegans. Uh, bottom line, without dwelling on it too much, is we've seen zero toxicity associated with this. We've found, we've been, been unable to detect nanomaterials released from those materials. Um, uh, as I showed you with the membranes, we could detect some, but with the materials we received from NIST, which were sanded, basically, uh, materials, there, were, there was no release there, and certainly no, uh, that we could see, no detectable uh, release, and no um, toxicity uh, detected there as well. Okay, so there was uh, some life cycle issues associated with the use of nanomaterials in these membranes. Back to developing the technology. So we can, we make membranes in the lab. Uh, we like to do it, uh, the, the, the size of membranes we make is typically on the order of a, the size of a sheet of paper. 
uh, but of course you want to scale this up. And so to do this, one of the most uh, uh, interesting geometries, of course, for making membranes at large scale, again, going back to this issue of packing density and having a membrane geometry that will be cost effective, is the hollow fiber uh, membrane. And so uh, a former postdoc, Ismail Kojuku, who is now, uh, he's at the Istanbul Institute of Technology and heads a, a major membrane uh, research uh, uh, institute there. He has all sorts of terrific toys. Well, they're not toys. Uh, this is uh, he can make membranes in large quantities. And so um, uh, Charles uh, Delanois, who was uh, making those membranes and carboxylating them to different degrees and so on, uh, he went off and spent some time there. This is uh, 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 the setup for spinning hollow fiber uh, membranes. Uh, the one thing that I want to point out is you spin the hollow fiber, you have a nozzle here. Okay, there's a lot of other parameters that come into play in making a hollow fiber compared with making a flat sheet of membranes like we do in the lab. The hollow fiber, the nozzle, the diameter of the nozzle, the rates at which uh, the solvent and the, uh, the, uh, the monomer are coming together, the, um, uh, the uptake rate on the, the, the take-up roll here, the amount, the gap uh, uh, between where it comes out of the nozzle and where it hits the coagulation tank, which is usually just uh, water. Uh, all of these things and others uh, play a role in determining, even if you weren't using nanomaterials, they play a role in determining the morphology of the membrane that's created. And so uh, what, when you add nanomaterials, you're basically adding another phase to an already very complex system, and that really complicates the interaction between all of those uh, those parameters. And I, I don't, it's, it's really a fascinating story. I don't have the time to get into it altogether. But here's sort of a summary. So here's uh, a polyether sulfone uh, membrane uh, that we're making and uh, different degrees of uh, carbon nanotubes added with two kinds of functionalization, carboxylation and hydroxylation. And you can see very clearly uh, changes in the morphology of the membranes that are formed. And uh, whether or not you increase the strength of the membrane, whether or not you uh, 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 change the permeability of the membrane, all of these things uh, uh, are vary as a function of the interaction between all those processes, uh, the, the air gap, the uh, uptake rate, and so on. So it's a, from an engineering standpoint, kind of a, an optimization problem that's, that's really very, very interesting. Uh, the last um, sort of instance uh, here that I'd like to, to uh, uh, present to you is uh, s some work, again, that Charles has been involved in and was really inspired by uh, David Jasby, who uh, is now an assistant professor here at Riverside. And here's today, where's, where's David? Where are you? Is he here still? There he is. That's the guy there. Okay, so um, uh, here the idea was to take carbon nanotubes, and uh, we had this platform for different strategies for maybe being able to put carbon nanotubes into polymers. And in this case, uh, putting them, as I showed you earlier, we could put carbon nanotubes into a polyamide membrane. We could do that. So what happens when you take that polyamide and make, it, make the carbon nanotubes very, very concentrated in that polyamide composite and put that on a uh, support, okay, like polyethylene here. So um, uh, we have a thin film composite that we're forming. And the goal here was to make an electrically conductive membrane to make a membrane that uh, the, the this, this surface film here would carry, um, would carry electricity and would have potentially some benefits. Well, there's, there's a number of things that we might do with it, but David's idea was that we could minimize biofouling uh, by uh, running an alternating current through that. So again, uh, with uh, and without uh, carbon nanotubes, you see the difference uh, on the surface. You, here are uh, electron micrographs of what that looks like. And here is the, the actual uh, proof in the pudding here. So what you have is normalized flux over time when these things are put into a cell where you can apply a, a, pen, a potential across that. And fouling occurs, but uh, when you have an applied voltage, uh, you're able to reverse that fouling to a very high degree. So this looks very, very promising, and we're, we're quite excited about those results. So I'll, I'll end there. I just want to, again, here's a picture of David. Uh, this is Charles de Lenoy. Uh, his hairstyle changes uh, weekly. Uh, Maria Feldalgo, who did some of the work on uh, the, the, the ceramic membranes that I'd mentioned. Uh, Lena Brunet, who got us started on so some of the, the, the Paula, the, uh, um, the uh, 
uh, polymer uh, uh, composites, uh, the ones that didn't work, uh, sadly. Uh, Hossam, who I'd mentioned, uh, Shaki uh, and uh, Soryang Che, uh, who uh, uh, both worked on the um, uh, carbon nanotube composites as well. Benjamin Espinas, there's Andy Barron there back at Rice, Zach Hendren, who we've been, these membranes I should mention, by, by tailoring these properties uh, so that you have um, better strength, uh, different electrical conductivity and so on, uh, this is a lead into what Amy is going to present, I hope. Uh, these are the kinds of things we want to do to be able to create membranes that will help us in making membranes for for membrane distillation, for forward osmosis, different kinds of membrane processes. And actually, uh, uh, Zach Henron was, had worked entirely on, on membrane distillation, and I'll end it there. Thank Thanks. you. So time for questions. Yes, Mike? Microphone there to Mike. Mark, thanks very much for that interesting talk. Uh, I haven't gone on your website in a while to look at your center, but as I recall, initially you were going to be somewhat of an early warning system for us about the potential <laughs> dangers of uh, nanomaterials in the environment, and uh, I I'm wondering w where we are on that in terms of some of the work, is, is, <laughs> and, and if there's some aspects of what you've learned that provide some guidance uh, going forward about what you should and shouldn't do with, with nanomaterials. Yeah, so that's, of course, an entirely different topic, which are the, the implications of the nanomaterials as opposed to their uses that I presented today. Um, some of the really interesting things that we found are that, for example, nanomaterials can bioaccumulate. Uh, they, that is, they can be, they can trophically uh, 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 magnify, okay, so going through the trophic chain. Um, when we, th there's a picture that I have of a, a leaf where gold nanomaterials are, um, uh, you can see them under fluorescence in this leaf. They're in the veins of the leaf. And when we showed this to our external advisory board, there's a very distinguished uh, ecologist, uh, William Schlesinger, who saw that. And he, he came at the break, he came up and he said, you know, in your basic course in botany, you never learn that plants take up uh, metals as particles. And this is one of the, th I think for me, the, the really critical thing that we're learning in terms of the implication side is the way that nanomaterials interact with living systems. Are they going to be the next round of contaminants? Well, maybe. We haven't seen anything major yet. However, we are seeing that there are some very subtle long-term changes that occur in, um, um, uh, for example, in the, the uh, nitrogen cycle in, um, in some of our mesocosms that we work, uh, where nitrous oxide is produced to a greater degree when we add silver nanoparticles compared with when we don't or when we add other forms of silver. So long-winded answer, but that's... Uh, more questions? Everyone is waiting for the No one can break. stomach another long-winded answer. Uh, okay, thank you very okay. much, Mark. Thanks. <laughs>